Hello, and welcome to a special episode of Dairy Digressions, the new podcast of the American Dairy Science Association, the Journal of Dairy Science, and JDS Communications. I'm Matt Lucy, Editor-in-Chief of JDS Communications, and I'll be your host. We are coming to you from the ADSA Discover Conference 45 on Dairy Cattle Lifespan, taking place at the Englewood Resort in Itasca, Illinois. ADSA Discover Conferences bring together the top minds in the dairy industry. For these, for these special episodes, I will be sitting down with the experts who are attend well, who are attending or hope to attend the meeting uh, um, to get their thoughts on exciting new developments for dairy. If you enjoy dairy digressions or have any feedback for us, please let us know at ADSA at ADSA.org. And make sure to like, subscribe, and rate us on whatever platform you're listening to. And spread the word to a friend or colleague, especially in the great country of Canada, right? We, yeah, go Canada. And now let's get into the meeting today. We have a very nice person, a brilliant geneticist, Christine Bays. From New University of Guelph, is that what you would say? University of Guelph. I'm not. I don't even know what department you in. Department of Dairy Science, Christine. I'm the the chair actually of the Department of Animal Biosciences. Okay, Animal Biosciences. Is that is that where? Okay, Stephen LeBlanc was <laughs> with us. Are you in there with? Steve, are you Stephen's boss now? No, Stephen is across the road. He's in the veterinary college, and I'm in oh. the agricultural college. So. Okay. Okay. There's this happy rivalry going on there, but it's good because it challenges us all to be better. <laughs> well, we, we've had rivalries before on dairy digressions, okay? The last one was between the Belgians and the Dutch, or the Belgians and the Netherlands. I guess I had someone from Wagenen, and they were talking, and the, the people from the Belgium were, hey, you know, you forgot about us here, okay? So we'll keep the rivalry going. I forgot to mention you are a professor and department chair. I think that's a new job for you um in uh, uh in the canada research chair in life science genomics fair enough yeah that's 100 percent. so the um so first of all thank you for agreeing to talk to me uh christine and i got to know because we are on the committee that organized this discover conference on dairy longevity and we're going to talk a little bit about longevity in a, in a little bit but i want to talk a little bit about just sort of um um kind of your your history here and um so i thought you were you know i saw where you were you went to graduate school in germany so i'm thinking you're german but you're not german you're canadian i'm canadian my parents are belgian actually so i understand that rivalry between the oh. Dutch and belgians <laughs> so you, did you were you born in canada or born somewhere else i was born in stratford ontario about an hour west of guelph i know stratford but i don't know why i know stratford is there something special in stratford there's a beautiful theater, a Shakespearean theater. It's called Stratford upon the Avon, and there's a, a theater there. That might be it. Justin Bieber is from Stratford. Oh, that's it. I knew, him. I knew it was something like that, right? So <laughs> the, uh, so how did so your parents dairy farmers, or how did you get interested in dairy? My parents were dairy farmers. I was I was born on a dairy farm. I milked a lot of cows. I stacked a lot of hay. Drove a lot of tractors. Um, I had a pet cow named Mitzi. Um, oh. who I could ride. My sister got a pony, so it was a bit unfair. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I grew up on a dairy farm. We don't have it anymore. We have the land from it, but we sold the cows and the and the quota a number of years ago. Yeah, so that is so you have a strong dairy roots then. Absolutely. And you went you went to the University of Guelph and what majored in mathematics or something <laughs> like that or what? No, animal animal science. But I did a lot of uh, exchange programs. So I spent uh, nine months in in Moscow and another year in Germany before completing my all during my undergraduate degree. So I was in nine Guelph, months. Not really. <laughs> oh, fantastic! That's those international experiences are so important, and I think um, I think I think even you know today where there's I think one thing that, you know, I've traveled a lot and I think it helps to travel and just visit other countries. And I think what I find when I visit other nations is, you know, globally, nations might have their differences, but the people, people are, there's nice people everywhere, okay. everywhere. 
regardless of nation, you know, and I, I think that's important. So those international experiences, particularly early in life, Moscow must have been interesting. What were you doing over in Moscow? There's, are there any cows in Moscow? Did you find a cow in Moscow? I actually did find a cow in <laughs> Moscow, not in Moscow, but uh, yeah, I was, I, I didn't really like university when I got here. So after the first semester, I was looking for a different challenge. And in our program here at the University of Guelph, you can take, you're supposed to take a bunch of electives. So I saw this poster around Christmas time of my first semester that said, you know, go to Moscow, learn Russian. And I thought, huh, if I can combine that with my agricultural degree, it'll be, it'll be cool. So two weeks later, I was on a plane um, and I got all of my electives. I learned a little bit of Russian and worked at the, um, at an English school there teaching English. So by the time I got back to Canada, I sort of had myself figured out and could could continue on with my with my studies. So, do you speak Russian then? Tolka chut just a little. Oh bit. yeah, just a little bit. Hey, we could use some Russian listeners, okay? Like so, that. hey, <laughs> you could come on now. Let's. I've always wanted, you know, fascinated by Russia. I've never visited. I, I it's a place I want to visit. I want to see. There's so much history. Totally. And it's it's I always feel like it's just useful to put eyes on things, you know, and so now's not the time for some reasons that we all know about. It's not the time, but uh, maybe someday. So so then so you're an undergraduate and you're trying to tick through your little boxes. I got to take this and this this course. Dairy new jet genetics is on there, and you're like, oh God, I'm gonna take that. Is that how it went? Or did you have this love for genetics because of that old cow Missy? Missy Not did it all. to you. No. Not at all. I, I wasn't even thinking about genetics during my undergrad. Um okay. I uh my last year of the undergrad I did at the University of Hohenheim in um in Germany, and I had a prof there. He was awesome. He was a a really huge Bavarian guy who taught anatomy and physiology. He didn't have any notes. He didn't write anything down. He just talked and he yeah. was my favorite, but he was, he had nothing to do with, uh, with genetics, but I realized that, you know, animal science is, is pretty interesting. So I, I, when I finished my, I was in Germany, I came back home, um, graduated from Guelph, but realized that the beer and the bread in Germany was way better than in Canada, so I than in Canada, yeah, way better, way better. And well, you got those donuts, me. right? You got Tim Hortons at least in Canada. I'll have to, I'll have to bring that up with my Canadian friends. Oh, particularly Filippo Migliar. Well, you know, you got Tim Hortons. Why are you complaining, Italian guy? Right? You know the he's tough. He's, he's tough, tough. With food stuff though, Matt. He's uh, yeah, Italian, yeah, right? Right, hardcore. You know, <laughs> and uh, so, so, so you. So, so you did some time in Germany before you did your graduate degrees, because you did graduate degrees in Germany. Am I correct or wrong? You or are. Totally wrong? No, you're totally right. I did my master's. Um, yeah, after that one year exchange program, I realized that the beer was so good and the bread was so good that I did. <laughs> and the tuition was the right price, right? Because okay. people don't really pay tuition. So I uh, enrolled myself directly into the University of Hohenheim to do a master's degree, actually in the area of animal welfare. So oh. I did... Uh, uh, my master's is in, um, yeah, we we calculated demand curves for for poultry to get to feathers or sawdust and all sorts of things there. So I have a master's degree in animal welfare, but then I stayed in Germany to do my PhD as well, and that's where the the flip to genetics happened. So I did my my PhD in quantitative genetics at the Institute for Farm Animal, Bi animal Biology in Rostock. So the okay. northeastern corner, but okay. I was registered at the University of Kiel. So that was the weird path that I took. That is hardcore. Like you geneticists, all you do is math, right? <laughs> and it's hard enough, but then you got to deal with German math, which is double hard, right? Because they are so, okay, now I'm going to just probably get edited out. Those Germans are very precise. I have heard that about the Germans. Like there can be no mistakes in the mathematics, right? No, but it's really good training, to be honest with you. Even the language, like, so I had to learn German, of course, but it right. it really taught me how to, um, how to think a little bit differently, a little bit more structured. You know, I was a farm kid. I grew up picking rocks and throwing straw bales around and milking cows. <laughs> I didn't really have any structure at all yeah. it's amazing that i didn't die during my childhood so going to germany was actually pretty good for me personally because of the structure 
Yeah, I think this is a great, you know, I always tell my young people, um, you know, I advise undergraduates as a faculty member at the university and, you know, they sometimes are so constrained in their thinking and the way they approach the world. And, and I'm like, man, you're like, you're like 19 years old. You can do whatever you want, you know, <laughs> do it. I mean, what are you waiting for? You know, even just try to get them to travel, you know, it's like get a backpack and fly to Europe and just do the hostel thing and the trains and just, you know, do something. And yeah. it's interesting, isn't it? But, you know, you, I think you're a good example, you know, the exchange programs and just doing something is uh is important so all you young people out there okay you need to list you need to listen to this podcast to the end because you're going to find out how successful this lady is but also remember her um you know one of the things we're going to take away is that these educational experiences they don't have to be 50 miles from your hometown okay they can be and you'll grow they force you to grow fair enough they force you to grow, you know, and uh, I didn't, I didn't do the, I've done two sabbaticals, one in New Zealand, one in uh, Ireland. Um, I've traveled a lot and, and I didn't go as far as you, but I did go from New York to Kansas for my master's degree. And I, you know, and I shout out to K-State and Jeff Stevenson, um, but I tell you what, uh, talk about other side of the world. All right. Practically Kansas is a long way from New York. All right. You know, so the, uh, so, uh, so Christine, um, I want to ask you a little about the ca Canadian dairy scene right now. And, um, you know, what, uh, particularly, I know you're in Ontario. I think you're, you, I don't know, three or 400,000 cows somewhere in there. Quebec's got about to say a little bit, a few more, a few more, barely, barely, you know, a few oh. more. You know, they're probably cheating on their cow census. You know, no, no, don't say that about the French. All right. The, uh, anyway, so the, uh, but anyways, a uh, few more, but uh, tell me what, what, what are, what are Ontario dairy farmers talking about right now? Um, I think the, uh, the industry is talking a lot about solid non-fat so how to how to deal with that just because um the payment schedules in in Canada are of course based on on butter fat but there's a lot of other solids that that people are sort of working on trying to deal with we haven't gotten to the point of um the expertise that New Zealand has for example in boiling down their milk to uh <laughs> to just okay. powder is is not right. something that we're quite as interested in mm -hmm. but uh producers are talking a lot about that producers are talking about sustainability um mm -hmm. they're they're talking about um the interest rates which are higher than they have been in the last 20 years which mm -hmm. i mean in canada we've got our supply management system which which helps with that quite a bit but still land prices are are higher than they've ever been um yeah there's there's a lot of different things uh a lot of different things going on we concern your your farmers and of course for those that are not familiar um the Canadian dairy industry is uh, due to the pricing structure. It's different from the American dairy. Uh, smaller farms. I mean, you you ask, you know, I think if you step on a farm in Canada, you'll find you'll still find a lot of Thai stalls, particularly depending on where you're from, right? Yeah. And um, you'll seventy percent. What's that? Excuse me. Seventy percent, which is Se quite a which is a large number relative to the United States. And then you'll also find uh, the farms are not that large, maybe. I don't know, typical, I don't know what the median is. I don't know, 110, 100, some sort. Like yeah, so they're, they're a different kind of farm. It's a, it's a uh, as I've said in this podcast, it's a wonderful place to visit. It's a wonderful place to speak. You talk, you, I, I think because it's just a different style of farming. And I have nothing against American farming, but a 5,000 dollar cow Dry lot dairy in Idaho is a different beast than a hundred cow dairy, Thai style dairy in Ontario. Okay. The different sort of world, you know, right or wrong. That's it, but it's fine, right? We can have all sorts of things. Okay. You know, everything is good. Anything that consumers are concerned about? Do you feel like consumers in Canada trust their milk supply? I think they still do. Um, but we have to be uh, really cognizant of the fact that you know, there's a, there's a whole new generation coming through. People are a lot more critical of where their food is coming from, mm. not only in mm. terms of, you know, the environmental impacts, but also in terms of um, their health. 
um, there's a lot of allergies and that sort of thing that that are coming up and, and people generally are kind of critical about the ethics of raising animals and using animal products and that whole that whole discussion i think is is similar in the us uh in europe and and in canada as well but we still have a pretty big um animal agricultural industry and we do have a pretty big dairy industry compared to the other industries so yeah there's there's some shifting things going on going on there I think it's interesting. I was reading um, an article by Daryl Nidham, who we talked to yesterday, and it was just about people often forget that the contribution that dairy products make to the human diet. In, in the United States, it's probably about 10% of the uh, human diet is, is can be linked to dairy. And uh, Daryl wrote a really interesting article about, okay, well, let's just take this away. Let's see what we got. And, and you know, it's, it's not... Y- y- do we really even have the foodstuffs in the uh, in the in the markets to replace the role that dairy plays in human nutrition? And he he brought up things specific things, you know. And I thought that was kind of interesting, you know. Well, y- you know, if we don't have a dairy cow, um, what would you have to eat? Right? It's an Milk interesting almonds. question. <laughs> Milk almonds, yeah, right, yeah, yeah, and so the um, so that's a big conversation. I'm sure it's a conversation, you know, milk alternatives, and then um, it's it's just a really um, 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 interesting comments about about the role that dairy plays, and maybe we just don't tell the story well enough, you know, about it, what it what it plays. You know, I, I think it's um, um. It's just um, maybe we just don't tell the story the way we need to tell it. I don't know. You know, we're, I don't I don't know what that is. But um, I, I always like the fact that when I teach dairy, you, you probably appreciate this, Christine. You know, I hold up a jug of milk and I just basically read the ingredient label. And it's basically <laughs> it's milk and vitamin D. I don't know if you add vitamin D in Canada, but we add vitamin D in, in America. It's, there's not a lot to it. Right. It's not a lot to it. You know, it's not a lot of stuff there. So I want to ask you about this resilient dairy genome product uh, project, okay? Because this is a massive project. I think you're leading the project, or are you the leader? I'm the I'm the leader, but I have some co leads. Um, you have some co leads, and I, I'm, we're going to give them a little shout out here, okay? I uh, Ronaldo Seri, right? Yep. Out at UBC, good Florida guy. Okay, let's shout out to <laughs> University of Florida. Go right, Ronaldo, Mark Andre. I'd see- Sirard, Mark Andre Sirard, Laval. Yeah. You know, so he's your well, you got two repro guys already. Is this all about repro? <laughs> I mean, aren't those two guys repro? He's and Mark then- Andre is actually covering like the high risk, high reward part, which is the epigenomics, which we haven't figured out how to apply yet, but he's he's got that section covered. He's got that and what is Ronaldo doing for you on this project? Ronaldo is uh helping us develop new fertility traits. So he's okay reproductive physiologist of course and and we're looking at how to use some of these automated sensor um some of this information coming in from automated sensors Mm -hmm. into uh you know a routine breeding value estimation that's a little bit more objective than whether the breeder thinks that the cow is in heat or what he decides or she decides is the voluntary waiting period etc etc we're trying to get closer to the biology of the cow and Ronaldo is is really weaving this um, into his research program, which mm-hmm. is really nice because we can both learn a lot from each other. I think, even though he's a vet, I guess, right? <laughs> well, he um, so then um, he may be a vet, but I know he has. I think he has a PhD from Florida. I know he was at Florida, right? I'm sure he's at Florida. The uh, but so uh, and both of those guys are are brilliant. So you've selected excellent team members. Congratulations. Then you got a, a gentleman I don't think I know, but maybe I do, Paul St- St- Stuthard. And he's at yeah. St- University of Alberta. So what, what is his role that he plays? He's a he's a brilliant bioinformatician. He's been okay. involved in all of the really big um, FANG projects. He's been involved in the Thousand Bull Genomes Project right from the get-go. He's, uh, yeah, he's a, he's our bioinformatician wizard guy <laughs> so this is a this is a th- is this funded by the canadian government is it is that who funded this thing 
also, yeah. So the it, there was a whole bunch of different funding partners, but the, the main chunk of funding came from uh, an organization called Genome Canada. Okay. And then we have also provincial um, genome centers like Genome BC, Genome Alberta, Ontario Genomics, and Genome Quebec, who have also gotten provincial funding. And then we also have industry partners in Canada, but also internationally. So um, the Resilient Dairy Genome Project is also partnering with uh, Mike Vandahar's FFAR oh. project. Mm -hmm. um, you, we meet regularly with the, the team there with, with members from mm -hmm. University of Florida, mm -hmm. uh, Wisconsin, um, Iowa State, and Michigan State University. Uh, so we've got a really good hub, but also across the pond, right? People from Switzerland, from Denmark, from Spain are, are huge contributors. Um, yeah, so it's a it's a fun it's a fun project. You mentioned in your uh, on your website there's thirty co investigators and over thirty five co -invest thirty co investigators collaborators and users and over thirty five international partner organizations. So this is a uh, this is a massive uh, effort. And I I was just thinking we don't give many shout outs. So you you mentioned AI cooperatives in Canada. Is CMEX okay? Now this is a digression, but is CMEX still the major? They're the they're they're still the major AI cooperative in Canada. Am I correct? Barely, barely. According to market share, they're they're about fifty percent now. I think. Oh. Yeah, in Canada, mm -hmm. but internationally, they're quite um they're quite busy as well. <laughs> well, who's the other fifty percent? Let me ask. St Genetics or something like that. I mean, who's the other fifty percent? All sorts of people or what? Yeah, there's. I mean, there's Select Sires. There's Alta. There's um. They're all up in there, there's right? ST, there's all. They've all got their their parts, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I always the. Uh, I could tell you stories about that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, I could tell you stories about that. We'll digress. Okay. Yeah. We'll digress. Okay. So, uh, but it's interesting. It's like, I get people in America say, well, we only use CMEX, uh, CMEX semen, you know? And I said, oh, why? Well, because, of the, you know, the Canadian sires are all better than the American sires. And I'm like, they're all the same. Okay. It's all the same. I mean, the descendants of two bulls, I don't know, whatever those two bulls were forever ago and I always sort of smile okay they're all kind of the same all right you know we're all making milk is that fair or not fair oh Matt you're into prickly territory okay uh, you don't have to answer that question <laughs> these are funder all right you're right I agree Christine we do find those CMEX bulls are way better all right I don't know if kidding. they're better I don't know if they're better I'm just saying that everybody it's you know, a little bit of healthy competition is is pretty good. And to be like honest it. with yeah. you, in Canada, we're we're happy to have CMEX still because they they're technically producer owned, right? So they're yeah. technically a cooperative. Yeah. Well, CMEX maybe not, but CIAQ and WestGen and EastGen, the ones who sort of own CMEX, they're the, yeah. the ones who are having the technicians on the ground. So they're like, there's this idea of homegrownness, I guess, a bit, and and we don't have much of that in Canada, so yeah. we're we're happy about that no i i tell you i i talk <laughs> about cmax and the reason i know cmax very well is i was out in the fraser valley giving some talks and uh i got to know some cmax guys and they were just the, the nicest people lovely people spent time with me showed me all these beautiful herds out in the fraser valley not that you don't have beautiful herds in ontario but they got some nice herds and nice. spent a lot of time it was a wonderful thing and they were we were talking and there's, oh, we got these robot ready sires. And what's a robot? You know, I was just learning so much from those guys. So they were super. So we got into, we we went into this project without even defining what in the world resilience is. I mean, the resilient dairy cow. Oh, come on, Christine. Give it, give me the elevator presentation. Uh, oh, wow. Resilient dairy cow. Okay. Because yeah. around here we're, okay, we're at this, this discover conference whoa nobody agrees on anything let alone what resilience is so why don't you why don't you just clarify so i can walk into this conference and say uh, i just talked to christine and let me tell you what resilience is all right yeah so we're trying to get um we're looking at re defining resiliency as uh, an animal that is able to still produce still be fertile still live a long and healthy life but also um maintaining her fertility and uh not getting ill delivering a calf being productive but reducing her environmental 
footprint by reducing the amount of emission, emissions that she gives off and also improving her feed efficiency. So right. in German, there was a term that the egg laying wool milk sow, which is like everything all encompassed into oh, one. Okay. Yes. And that's what we're looking at for our, um, for our resilient cows. They, I know that the Dutch have, have thought about, you know, an animal that's able to come back from perturbations. Mm -hmm. uh, but in our case, we're, we're really trying to have um, an animal that's that's resilient for for the future that's coming uh, for us. So I, I have a question about this because um, they, they've been talking a lot about they've been kind of talking about resilience, longevity, that sort of thing. Now, is is so you're a geneticist and, and you're a geneticist. And I know that there's some genetics or there's genetics organizations involved in this. So for this resilient, dare, okay, the word genomes in the project. So as I assume the focus is on genetics to achieve this end. Is that correct? Not on new mastitis treatments or new treatments to achieve this end. We're we're really trying to uh, to get out of this geneticist only world. So okay. we've come to the realization, I think that I can speak for everybody that we do have to work together. It's a pretty complicated um, industry and it's a pretty complicated, a, a cow is a pretty complicated animal. So the Resilient yeah. Dairy Genome Project is really focusing, there's a bunch of different activities. The first three are kind of like the the fuel tank of the project. Uh, they're mm -hmm. looking at, look. so Ronaldo, you mentioned he's leading activity one, which is focused on fertility. Then we have a, an activity that's focused on health, um, mm. particularly in calves. Then the third activity mm. is focused on, on um, methane and feed efficiency. Those mm. three, so those three activities are kind of like novel trait, novel mm -hmm. phenotype activities, mm -hmm. but they flow into the engine of our project, which mm -hmm. also consists of three activities, one led by Dr. Flavio Schenkel here at the University of Guelph, looking at the, you know, the the genetic correlations between these new traits and between these new traits and the current traits in the index. Mm -hmm. and we've got Mark andre Serard, who's doing the epigenomic stuff, the really mm -hmm. sexy, cool stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and Paul Sothard is leading um, the, the data management um, activity. And as mm -hmm. with all Genome Canada projects, they're all sort of within what we call the gels, the gels component that we mm -hmm. have to look at. That is genomics, it's ethical, environmental, economic, legal, and societal impacts. So that's more of wow. a social science aspect uh -huh. the project. That's being done by uh, Dr. Ellen Goddard at the University of Alberta. And that's really, that's a really interesting part of these Genome Canada projects because they force the, the natural scientists to work with the other scientists, right? With, right. with sort of political scientists and econ right. economists and that sort of thing. And then the final, um, the final activity in this project is is really translation and implementation because we can do the coolest work in the world, but if it doesn't get to the farmers, it's not, uh, it's not useful. So we've been really successful. Uh, we we followed Filippo's path with his efficient mm. dairy genome project, which was focused mm -hmm. on methane emission and feed efficiency. We've brought that on. We've included these additional new traits in fertility and health while mm -hmm. maintaining the, the increase in, in our database of, of methane and feed efficiency evaluation. So part of it is new traits, part of it is methodologies. And of course, the, the biggest part of it is really how to get this up and running. And, and we did that. So the, right. the methane evaluations, the national evaluation was published in April of this year. We're, we're mm -hmm. super proud, super happy about that. Mm. Um, but it just shows that when everybody works together, you can really do you can do cool things. So we we still have to do the the fertility stuff and the the health stuff. That's going to be mm -hmm. into that's going to come into a resiliency index mm -hmm. um, that will hopefully be delivered by Lactonet in the coming years. But we've we've got an extension thanks to COVID and all that. So we'll be working on this till twenty twenty five probably. Oh, fantastic. Okay. And then you had, after that, you got five years to carbon net zero, so you can do it, right? That's how. <laughs> Easy peasy. No problem. Teddy, I don't know if it's 2030 in Canada or 2050 in Canada for dairy net zero, but it doesn't matter. The Americans are going to, if you say 2050, we're going to say 2049. So we can say we did it first. That's how the <laughs> Americans are. Okay. So I'm just going to tell everybody it's like, we're going for carbon net zero in America in 2049, okay? Because you know you. we can't we can't beat you in hockey, but you know whatever we can try to beat you in carbon net zero. That would be a health 
Yeah, totally. totally that would be a healthy competition, wouldn't it? Who's going to get to carbon net zero first? Okay. And, oh, and uh, that'd be fun, right? That would be awesome. I mean, I, you know, it's interesting at this, at this, uh, at this conference um, that we're here, it's really come down to questions about, you know, when we talk about longevity, there's a lot of discussion about obviously climate, yeah. less discussion about the environment, which is interesting. And I, I know everybody wants to talk about GHGs, right? And I don't know enough of, I, I know what they are, but but then, you know, there's less discussion about the environment. In other words, pollution, like, and the, the Europeans talk a lot about nitrogen or nitrates or whatever pollution. Does your, do you guys talk about pollution is, do you know what I'm saying? The pollution. The, like in the water waterways and that's Yeah. And what, is that part of your thing? Or are you just focusing on um, methane and greenhouse gas emissions? Right now we're focusing on methane and greenhouse gas emissions, but there are mm -hmm. a number of of course, as every university, right? There's people who mm. work on soils and and microbiomes of soils and waterways, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I think that's going to be the key moving forward is that we 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 stop siloing again. We we start to work together because you might have one group looking at the toenail of the elephant, someone else is looking at the kneecap, and someone right. else is looking at the tail. And until you put it all together, you don't know what you're you don't know what you're doing. Really. So you hope by at least by 2025, for example, did you say 2025? I said 20. I didn't say anything, but it's 2050 for Canada. <laughs> no, no. But the, how long does this funding go till 2025? Uh, our, this The current Re Resilient Dairy Genome Project will run till 2025. Um, but we're really excited that we Genome Canada has announced uh, the sort of winners of a new competition. Oh. And that... Um, that we actually have been funded there as well. So we have our resilient dairy genome project, but we've got mm -hmm. the third and final sort of capstone project. Oh, fantastic. Coming. We're ramping it up right now, but we hope to have, um, with that new project, we're hoping to have an integration of the genetic knowledge that we've gained in the past mm -hmm. two projects, as well as incorporating and weaving in 